Amen. So if you would, if you have a Bible, turn with me to the book of James. In the latter part of the New Testament, if you don't have a Bible, uh, we have some extras. They're in the windowsills, or we've got some ushers that will pass it around. If you want to wave, uh, put your hand up, they'll bring one to you. So we started this series last week, and we've titled it, Let's Talk About It. Because if you study James and as a, as a pastor and apostle in the early church, who dealt with a lot of persecution, his heart, sort of as he comes to this point in his life where he's like, I want to share all that I've experienced and all the wisdom I've gained from from God's word and from the teachings and the life of Jesus. And he's, he's kind of coming at them like, look, you need to understand how you can really live this life as a Christian. And they say James is kind of like an in your face apostle. And so he wants to sort of bring it in the way that we're trying to bring it now where we just sort of sit together, we, 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 we dig into God's word, and we talk about what's really going on and how we can really live this out. That's, what we, that's where we started last week. If you remember, I spoke from the beginning of James chapter 1, and we went all the way from verse 1 to verse 12. And I talked about this, I presented this question, should we really enjoy trials? These, these hardships, these challenges that come in life in different ways, shape, or form, but God is allowing them, he's using them to test us for this purpose, which hopefully you remember is that he wants us to become more like him, to be conformed, to be, to be made and, 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 and perfected and completed in his image. So those things he allows to happen that we deal with, they're to grow us, to mature us, to become more like him. And I said there's a few ways we can approach that once we've understood that purpose, that we choose joy, we choose wisdom, and we choose humility. And I'm not going to repeat the whole message. If you missed it, it's still on Facebook. You can go and get it. But we're going to continue from that point today. I stopped in verse 12, and so we're going to pick up in verse 13 of James chapter 1. And here there's a, there's a slight transition that James makes, although it's actually still connected, and I hope to help you understand that as we go through the rest of chapter 1. So he was talking about trials And now he's going to switch a little bit to talk about temptations. And they are related, but they're also different. In fact, they share sort of the same root word. But what's different about the trials versus the temptations is there's a different source and there's a different purpose. Okay, we said the trials were things that God allowed or, or maybe presented or things that we've done, but he still finds a way to work for our good to make him more like him. Well, the temptation is, in some ways, the opposite of that. It's, it's those things, of those desires, those sort of sinful, fleshly ways that we have where we're enticed, where we're pulled away from God. So we're, that the enemy and those things, that sort of sinful part of our flesh that we were all born with, is working to try to get us away from looking more like Jesus. It's trying to get us to live life on our own and to be separate from him and to give in to do whatever we want, however we want, whenever we want. The temptation is trying to take us in that opposite direction, if you will. It's sort of like this. The the trials are trying to develop us to be more like Jesus, but the temptations are trying to destroy us so that we don't look anything like Jesus. And so we see that. We see that here, and let's start in verse 13 through verse 15 of James chapter 1. It says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So notice James is actually sort of trying to set the record straight here from the beginning. Because, you know, unlike people of the day who today we we never complain, we never have issue, we never want to blame God for something that's not really his, right? We never do that. But in this time, he knew that some of the believers had an issue with taking what was actually happening in their life and trying to blame it on God. So when they were struggling with temptations from their own desires and their own flesh, they were seemingly starting to put that on God and get angry and get frustrated. Well, God, why is this? Why is this happening? And and James is like, no, hold hold up a second. Hold up a second. You're being tempted not because God is tempting you, 
this is not from God. God was, he was trying to use that trial to make you more like him, but there's this other thing that comes from that, that sinful nature, that fleshly desire, I, 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 that lust, whether it's a, a physical, sexual lust, a, a greed, a, a, a wanting things, a wanting to be considered better than people, wanting to attain a status, wanting to look better in certain people's eyes, wanting to feel better about yourself. Some of these things that can turn into being pulled away. Right? And, and it's enticing us. So we're drawn more and more to, to, to operate out of those desires. And look, see, how the, see how the process happens? You, you are dragged away by your own evil desire and enticed. Now it starts with the desire and there's a temptation. Now we all face temptations. But what we, how we choose to respond to that is then what happens next, right? Because then now... After that desire has conceived, we have them, and then we're pulling into, we give into the temptation. Now we start to see sin giving, coming out. It's giving birth to sin. Then we make those choices, and we get into those situations, and we get into those environments. We get into those relationships, and now we're disconnected from God because we're doing our own thing. And eventually, when that sin is full grown, it gives birth to death. It leads us completely away to God. And for some of us who have not receive the word and not follow the Lord as his disciple, not receive his salvation and transformation, then that is our destination. Eternal death, which is essentially separation from God. Separation from the one who's saying, I've made you for a purpose to be completely like me. But the temptation is trying to take you to completely the other side to ultimately destroy you so that you are dead internally, dead spiritually. From our temptation. That's, that's what's going on here. And that's where he starts. And so he's sort of making sure, just like in the trials, he made sure you understand the purpose to make you more like him. And the temptation, like, you need to understand the purpose. Because these temptations are trying to lead you to death. Mm-hmm. To lead you to look nothing like Jesus. And so he starts there. And then he continues to try to help them understand this. In verse 16, he says, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. See, the truth is a lot of us are deceived. We've been tricked. Well, it's not that bad if I do this. And, you know, God's not going to really mind. Or, or, then, or like he was saying before, we get into these situations and then we start blaming God. You're blaming God that you went and did this inappropriate thing. You chose to satisfy that fleshly desire in this way and then we're going to get mad at God. Well, God, did you bring this on? Did you? No. He's saying God is not tempting you. He's not leading you to sin to see if you're a good enough Christian. You, you, pull, you were pulled into that by your own desires, and Come you on. gave in to that temptation, and you chose to sin. So don't, don't sit there and blame God for that. Now, look, he's offering grace. He's offering to bring you back. But to stay there and to try to blame God and to try to sit in that place is not, is not what he is, is intending. It's certainly not what he's asking of you. So... There he is. He says, don't be deceived. Don't be tricked. I'm trying to help you see the truth. Here it is, verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. See, you got to understand, God only wants to give you things that are good. He only wants to give you perfect gifts. You are going to have responsibility to choose and what your actions are going to be, and there's going to be some consequences of that. But, but your God, your Father, is not a God up there waiting to punish you. He's not a God up there waiting to, to judge you. He's not a God, Father, who's up there waiting to, to strike you and, and send some lightning bolt down against you because you messed up. No, he is a God who only brings good and perfect gifts because what he wants for you is to experience the fullness of him, to experience the abundance of life, to, to walk into the purpose that he's created you for. God brings good and perfect gifts for us. So if it's not that, then that's not God's desire for you. It must have been some other desires that you're trying to live out in your flesh, and then you're trying to attach that to God, because no, that's not who God is. It's a good and perfect gift. He's, he is the, the father of the heavenly lights. He's, he's like the, the sun that always shines brightly. Even when the clouds are in the way, he's still there shining, right? He, he's bringing us the warmth, the protection, the provision. He's giving us life. But notice what it says. It's, it says, the father of the heaven lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Somehow we think, we think God changes. 
No, we, you would say, no, he doesn't change, but we act like that sometimes because when we get in certain situations and it's not like how we want it or it's not the experience we want to have and we're not that happy, then we start thinking, well, God, does God do something? Did God move away? Is God like the shifting shadows? But, in, but really what it is, is is we've drifted away. We keep going down this path and walking towards the things of our own desires and fulfilling our own flesh. And the next thing you know, we end up in the shadows. Behind these things where, where there seems to be a wall between us and God. But right now, if you notice, the lights in the room are the sun and the sky. They haven't gone anywhere. But I'm over here in the shadows because of my own choices. And I follow my own temptation and my own desire. But, but instead of recognizing that and returning to him, sometimes I want to sit over here and just wallow in it and complain. And God doesn't see me. God doesn't care about me. God doesn't want it. Where is God? Where is God? You're in the shifting shadows. God's not a shifting shadow. The light is still there. It hasn't moved. The sun hasn't moved its position. It hasn't lost its power. It hasn't lost its authority. He's inviting us to return to him, to follow him and not stay there. Amen. Living in those shifting shadows, complaining and frustrated. Well. Here's, here's what he said he did. He said in verse 18, he chose. I'm stopping right there. Did you see that? He chose. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth. That we may, might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Do you, do, you, do you get that God shows you? Those of you who have followed him and believe in him, he, he's chosen you. He's chosen to birth you to become a new creature, a new creation. He chose to give you a new heart. He chose to give you a new mind. He chose to, to make you new. So all of that woundedness and brokenness and, and filth and, and, and things you've done wrong and all the list and let us long of things that you've failed and you've done on your own selfish desire. He's saying, look, I chose to give you that new birth. Hey, thank you. I chose that. And how did he do it? He did it through the word of truth, yes. through the gospel, the gospel, the story, the life of Jesus that says what we remembered before because Jesus paid the perfect sacrifice. Yes. Regardless of your worthiness, of your, regardless of your brokenness, he chose to do that so you could experience new life. Hallelujah. Not just on your own, but new life with him. Hallelujah. To know him now and forever, that, that's eternal life. He chose that for you. And here's, here's the other piece of this. And he's gonna, this is going to be a little theme for the next few verses. He, he lays out again the purpose. Because when he says that we might be, he's saying, look, check this out. This is the purpose. That we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Do you, I don't know if you understand the first fruits. In the Old Testament, we see this, this, this word and this description used around the, the first fruits of the harvest that would be given back to God as a, as a tithe or as an offering, as a blessing back to God to say, look, I'm grateful for all you've done for me, so I'm going to take the first fruits, that which is most valuable to me, and I'm going to give it back to you. So God is saying, I'm choosing you, and you... Look around the room. You all, all of us, y'all, we are the first fruits because we are the most valuable to him. So he has given us the truth because he values us the most. And now he's saying, I value you so much that I want you to be the first ones to represent me. That the best of all that I've created is you, and I'm giving you the responsibility to be that representation throughout generations of my best, the things that I value the most. So why would we, as the thing that God values the most, decide to give in to these desires and these temptations that would lead us away from the one that values us the most so we can have some temporary momentary satisfaction? See, it doesn't really make sense when you think of it in that terms. God values me so highly that he wants me to be that perfected, complete representation of him, to be like him. But why would I give up that to try to choose something that is far less than that? In fact, it's not anything compared to that, but it's just something I'm trying to find some feeling from. When my value is over here, greatly, highly appreciated, 
purpose is over here where he's called me to be his representation, to be his first fruit, to be the best of what he's made. So he has designed and created for us to be that first fruit, that representation of him. And now here's where James gets a little more in your face. So brace yourselves if you're not feeling secure today. It's okay. Verse 19 and 20 says it like this. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Look, y'all, pay attention. This is what he's saying. Hold up. Here's what you really need to know. Make sure you get this. Make sure you get this. He says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Now, I've studied this and. And, and different uh, theologians and different uh, Bible scholars, you know, think there's some room for a couple different interpretations of this. And I think that's true. There's principles here as it applies to relationships and our own self. But, but I'll tell you what I think and others do. I think this is most likely still talking about the same context of what he was just talking about. I mean, that only makes sense to me. He's still talking about dealing with temptations and previously dealing with trials. So it's saying... In these trials, and in this case, also in these temptations, here's what I need you to do. I need you to be quick to listen. So you're going through something, even a t whether it's a test or whether it's a temptation to try to lure you away from God, you're going through something, here's what I need you to do. I need you to listen. Now, that begs the question, what are you listening to? You're listening to the word of truth which has been given to you. Are we listening to his word, Come on, work. to what he has left to speak to us? Is our first inclination when something starts to challenge us or something starts to tempt, to tempt us is our first, to, first reaction to be like, God, what did you say? Come on. What does your word say? Because he knows here's, here's, our, here's our likely reaction because he goes right from that and he says, slow to speak. Uh -oh. He's basically saying, look, I know what you want to do. You want to start talking. You want to start complaining. You want to start trying to figure it out or tell this person, and, yeah, look at this. How can, how can God do this to me? You, you want to start talking about it, creating your own point of view and, and spitting out your own truth to try to solve the situation. And he's saying, no, shut up. Shut up and just listen to the word. Can you just sit down somewhere and listen to what I'm trying to tell you? I'm giving you the answers. I'm giving you the hope. I'm giving you the, the strength. I'm giving you the wisdom that you're lacking. Will you just shut up and listen to the word? Stop trying to make it your own thing and figure it out your own self and put some language around it. Just, just listen to the word. Because see, what happens when you start talking, you can't figure it out. So then you get frustrated, and then now you're going to have to need to be slow to become angry because now you're over here mad at God, talking about why is this happening? Why did God do this? Why doesn't he love me enough? Why doesn't he care for me? Why did that person do it? you got all these reasons now to become angry. And God is saying, look, you didn't even need to go through all that. Yeah. Just shut up and listen. Jesus, See, that, that, that word for anger is literally, it's, like, it's this biological term that the, the plants and the fruit, when they would swell up with like sort of the juice on the inside and they would expand, he's like, that's kind of what's happening with the anger. He's saying you had to slow down because you're swelling up with all this stuff you're, you're carrying and you're feeling and you're, you're talking about and you're trying to manage on your own. You're swelling up. And so this fruit that I made to be, to be perfect, to be, to be the right kind of juicy and ready to represent me, well, now it's all swoll swollen up and it's ready to burst and it's going to lose its purpose. My God. You're not going to be able to even share that because you're going to be useless. Because you're going to burst because you're giving into anger and you're, you're, you're doubting God and you're questioning him and you're all this emotion that's created because you just didn't listen to the word. Yeah. Yeah. To take the truth that he's given you and apply it Amen. to your life. That's good. That's good. Because that anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. What God wants is what's divinely righteous. It's perfect. It's, it's just. It's right. It's the way it should be. That's what he wants in all these situations. And he's given us the directions to get us to that as we listen and we discern and we're sensitive to what the Spirit speaks to us as we study the Word, that we receive godly counsel, as we pray and listen to what he's saying and talk about it with him. Amen. That's where he leads us. And then he challenges them again because 
you know, James don't play, so he's got to keep going. Verse 21 says, therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. So he's kind of continuing this sort of garden analogy. It's like, look, the word has been planted in you. I've, I've, I've turned your heart. I've made you new. I've, I've given you that good soil that you didn't have before. You had a bunch of nasty, dry rocks and hard things in your heart. And I've given you a new heart that has good soil. And the word has been planted in you. Those who believe and who follow, I've planted that in you. But you got to be careful. You got to do some work in this, in this garden because there's going to be some pollution that comes. That moral filth, that's what that word is. It's like the pollution that wants to come and mess up your garden, right? Where that, that, that acid rain or whatever it may be is, is spilling in and, it, and it's trying to destroy that good earth that, that produces good fruit. The things of the world, the temptations of our flesh, the, the things that are against God that aren't just, aren't right. All of these things that we see so prevalent, he says, around us. It's like that the prevalence is like, I, I'm, I'm not a, I don't have a green thumb. I'm not big into gardening. I don't know all this stuff. But I, I, it's, it's amazing how, how much application there is to life and to scripture and, and all of that imagery. But it says it's so prevalent. And all I could think of is like, you ever seen one of those things that you, you don't even know if it was a garden because it's overgrown by weeds and, and all sorts of other vegetation that, that that was not what the garden, that just sort of grew up and it overtaken. And that's what it seems like here is like the evil of this world is, is, can overtake us. And, and, for, and sometimes we can stop and we can look at the things around our life and we're like, how did we get here? I, I, I thought I believed God, but I've gotten disconnected. I've stopped praying. I, I've stopped fellowshipping with other believers. I've stopped reading his word. And next thing you know, you're, at some point you kind of look up and you're like, I am in the midst of this overgrown, neglected piece of land that doesn't resemble this fruitful garden that I know God made for me to be. Because we let things in, and slowly, right, we, oh, it's all right if I watch this a little bit, or if I start saying this, or I do listen to this, or I take this, or, or I do this, and, and, and then gradually we're sucked into all that, and we end up over here, you know, with some desires met temporarily, but we're, we're just full of weeds, and it's overgrown, and we're far from the purpose that he's created us to be. So he brings this point to a head, and he says in verse 22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Here's my favorite four words. Do what it says. I don't know that I need to expound upon that, but I'll try a little bit. So it's here he's taking it a step further. You've heard the word. These are, these are believers these are people who've been in some church community. They've been, they've been studying the teaching of the apostles. He's saying, look, that's good, but that's not enough. So you can't just listen. You can't just come on a Sunday morning and try to stay awake through the sermon and then leave out and just live life. He's saying, that, that ain't it. You got to do what it says. So if you just hear the word, yeah, you've got something, but until you apply it, until you do it, until you live it out, until you make those godly choices, until you operate in that righteousness, until you seek justice and, and love mercy and all of those things, yeah. what was the point if you're not going to do it? My you can find something more entertaining to listen to than me on a Sunday morning, I'm sure. Well. You might even find something you enjoy reading more in, in some way. But if you want something that you can actually do that's going to have meaning, it's going to lead you towards purpose, it's going to lead you to look more like Jesus where you experience that abundance of life, then you need to listen and you need to do it. Hey. Hey. We need to do it. And then he continues to give them an example in verse 23 to verse 25. It says, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, check this out, they will be blessed in what they do. It seems like so many people want to figure out how you can be blessed. Well, James just laid it out to you. I, 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 I should charge for this. I'm telling you how you can be blessed. You can do what the word says. 
We don't need a book. I don't need a podcast. I don't even need a video. Just do what the word says if you want to be blessed. What else do we need to say? I mean, he's saying it right here. Look, you want to be blessed. You, the, the, and, and, well, some of us don't understand blessing, and that's probably a different message because we just think it's some good material thing that we want. But let me just summarize this real quickly. If you're blessed, you, you, you receive, you rejoice, and then you redistribute. So you can receive the, the, the goodness from God, that, that extra benefit, all the fullness of his benefits, and you can rejoice and praise him and thank you for it, and then you're also supposed to share it and pass it around, but nobody wants that kind of blessing. So if you want to be blessed, if you want to be able to receive, if you want to be able to rejoice, if you want to be able to redistribute it and pass it on to other people so that they can be blessed, do what the word says. And if you don't know what it says, you got to start by listening to it first. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then, okay, Lord, help me to do this. Help me to do this. Now, James, he's a, he's a good teacher because he's like, okay, I got y'all attention. Let me give you some examples of what this looks like. Y'all may not like these, but this is real right here. Verse 26. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves. And their religion is worthless. I'm just reading the verse. <laughs> but let me give you another one because some of y'all just need another shot. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. Colon, it's about to be real clear. To look after orphans and widows in their distress. Hear that one. Don't skip over that one. And to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So you're going through trials, you're going through temptations, but hopefully you, you come to this point where you want to understand what true religion is, what it really means to, to live for Jesus, not the church version, not all this list of do's and don'ts, but if you want to really know practically what it looks like to live for Jesus, to become more like him, he's given you three things, and they all start with the T in my version. Your tongue, your treatment of others, and your testimony. Are you willing to, to give God what you want to say or what you're going to say? Are you going to allow you depend on his strength to have that self-control? Because we know, right, in the power of the tongue is either death or life. And he knows how significant those words are that we speak. He's already told him to shut up and, and listen. Now he's saying, let me tell you this again. You've got to deal with that tongue. You've got you to deal with what's coming out of your mouth and how that impacts other people and how it impacts your own faith. Start there and then don't just deal with you. Look. The, the point of, of following Jesus is to be a blessing to others. He's telling them, look, care for those who have nothing to offer for you in return. The widows and orphans. Yeah, I can, I can give to somebody because I know maybe, you know, hey, I do this for Jose. Next week he's going to come and, you know, fix my car or whatever. Like, hey, that's easy to do. But to, to bless somebody, to show you love and you care for them, you see them as having value and dig dignity as an equal. I just want to give you this and I don't want you to give me nothing back. You don't even have to thank me. I just want to love you. That's, that's, that's how God was. He came. We didn't have nothing to offer him. But he just loved us because he saw us as valuable. He saw us as who we are. We may, we may, others may think we're the least of these, and you may think that others are the least of these. God's like, no, they're all the best of these because they're made in my image. So that's the work we're called to. That's why here in this church we, we care for those around us who may have less, who may be dealing with you know, the, the, the sins that are so prevalent in our world, all the injustice, all the racism, all the oppression, all of the, 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 the ways that we've, you know, put people into different socioeconomic classes and haven't given people true opportunity and, and to really grow. We, we want to deal with those things because we want to make sure that we're caring for others well and we're loving our neighbors. Whether they look like us or not, whether they have more or less than us, whether they speak a different language or whatever, we want to we love our neighbors. That's, yeah. the, that's the call he's given us. Deal with our tongues. Deal with how we treat each other. And I just summed up this last one as dealing with our testimony. Are we living and walking in integrity? Is our character like that of Christ? Or are we letting the things of the world influence us and shape us? And now we're walking over in this, this weedy place of, of temptation and, and falling into things that we shouldn't rather than keeping ourselves from all that pollution, from, from all that mess, and, and making sure we're staying honorable. We're, we're in the world but not of the world. We're, we're, we're a representation, an ambassador of Jesus. That's the call. That's the call. And I, I want to read this last part and try to get through it. But I, on Friday, I, I just needed to 
to, to, to read some of Apostle Harry's words. And I, I have the privilege of having this file that is a whole bunch of thoughts from the pastors that he had over the years. That he used to do, some of you remember something called a bulletin. It was in print and there were like words on it. Yeah, some of y'all don't know what that is, but we used to put them in the bulletin, and it would be the thoughts from the pastor. He would take a verse, and in his way, he'd just give us those nuggets around that word. Around that word. And I found one where he wrote around, about James 1, 22, the doing what it says. And it's on the screen. If you want to follow along with me, I'm just going to read this in closing because he said it better than I could. It says, the Bible says, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ from Romans 10, 17. Faith can be gained through hearing, but faith is proved by the things we do. Our test today is not how much we will hear and believe, but how much we will we hear, believe, and do. What the unsaved world needs to see is Christians short on talk and long on walk. There is a time where demonstration is in greater need than conversation. And that time is now for us. Father, we pray today as we have heard your word, that we would respond, God, by moving to do it. Not just listening to it, not just hearing it, but, but you would strengthen us to do what it says. God, that we would be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. That you would strengthen us to guard our tongues, to, to treat others well, and to love all people, and to demonstrate your heart and to carry your character and walk in your integrity and to resist the temptations and the, the evil and the filth that's in our nat fleshly nature and in this world around us. God, we want to, that to be true. We want to be about a walk and not just about a talk. We want it to be authentic and real. Not that we're, we're perfect in our own strength, but even as we read last week, God, we are made strong in our weakness because you empower us and you come through and show yourself strong that's our intention that's our desire and so I pray today for anyone who's feeling like they they want to make a different choice and they want to follow you today whether that's a, a first-time choice or a recommitment or a recognition that I've been that maybe the person would say I've been going my own way doing my own thing and the truth is it does feel like a mess I feel overwhelmed with all this stuff and I feel evil and stuff around me and if I'm honest, I, I don't want it to be that way. I want something different. Those of you that feel that way, we're praying for you now because Jesus offers you hope. He offers you true life and purpose as you enter into a relationship with him. He gives you strength to walk that out, to become more like him. The great thing is it's not something you have to do yourself, but he empowers you to be able to do it. So you... We're all qualified, we're all capable because it's not us. Actually, I guess the truth is we're not qualified, we're not capable, but he qualifies us, he makes us capable. So if that's you today, uh, if you're here, I invite you to raise your hand so we can know that we can pray with you. If you're, you're online, uh, just pray where you are, and if you reach out to us at another time, we'd be happy to follow up with you and, and encourage you and help you understand more of what the Bible says about this truth. Is there anyone here that would like to speak to someone so you can better understand what that reality is for your life. Real quick, don't be shy. It's all, we're all family. Praise God. Well, Lord, I just pray for everyone else that, that knows you but may admit today that they may be a little off course and gotten a little off track and they're wanting to, to come back to be all in and, and, and to, to do the work, not just to stay comfortable listening and hearing it, but to do it. God, move on those hearts today. Strengthen those of us who need that, to need, to need to, to be stepping out to do more, to love more, to care more, to, to share more, to all the things that you've called us to. Move in our hearts today, Lord, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for listening. Oh, one, one, one final note, I should say. It is my hope as a pastor when... I appreciate the way people come up to afterwards sometimes and try to encourage me because I, I can use it, you know, good message, good sermon, all that. I, I do appreciate that. But what I'd rather see is, thank you, Pastor, I'm going to go do that. I heard you, and I'm going to do it. So if you just, you know, want to make me feel a little bit better, just, just do it. 
You don't even have to tell me nothing. If you do it, I'll see it and God will be glorified. Amen. Praise the Lord.